Um, they ha- we have a you know a very atypical and unusual mating system, and it's driven by the fact that we have these absurdly long childhoods derived from the fact that we need to grow these very large brains. Mm. Uh, I want to switch gears a bit and talk about a few things that you're skeptical of in the book. Uh, not only, uh, like we spoke initially regarding these celebrations of the brain and you know how amazing it is, you're skeptical of that. You explained why. But I want to ask if you're skeptical of some other neurologist claims, maybe pop psychology brain scientists, that argue not only can different parts of the brain be mapped for different kinds of functions or maybe even different behaviors, um, like the basal ganglia might be involved in, you know, obsessive compulsive stuff, or that sight or smelling starts in the cortex. But some of these guys go further, and I want your take. They say that with certain diets or mental exercises or playing brain age on my DS light, that it can actually change brain anatomy to improve these functions. Do you buy all that? Well, uh, a little yes and a little no. So if we step back a bit and we ask the more general question, is it true that our experience in the world can change the very fine-scale anatomy of our brain? It can, can it make certain connections between neurons, these synapses you mentioned earlier, weaker and stronger? Uh, and thereby encode information in our brain? The answer is yes, absolutely. That's how we store memories in our brain. That's the way our experience can mold our brain. And we know that stress hormones can change the brain physically? or That is absolutely true. Stress hormones can, sex hormones can, the ovulatory cycle changes the brain physically. All of these things can happen. Exercise, physical exercise, uh, can have enormous effects on the fine structure of the brain as well. Vitamins, blueberries, stuff like that? Well, vitamins, probably not. (laughs) There I would start to get a little skeptical. Uh, Generally speaking, uh, um, most of the work on vitamins and health and vitamins on brain function have shown that if you have a basically healthy diet, if you're living in an affluent society and not just eating crap all the time, you're getting all the nutrients you need. Mm. And uh, the indications are that vitamin pills, you know, are, are a scam. They don't do anything for you at all. And I don't see any indication that they do anything for your brain either. Mm. Now, that said, I think there are actually very good indications that there are some things that can improve brain function. One of them is eating a heart-healthy diet. So if you have a healthy cardiovascular system, that means that you have better function in delivering blood to your brain. And particularly as you age, it seems that people who eat heart-healthy diets uh, age more successfully, have less loss of of cognitive power, less senile dementia. Hmm. It also seems like uh, statin drugs that people take to slow deposition of fatty deposits in the cardiovascular system also have uh, benefit for the aging brain as well. Uh, And exercise has an enormous benefit. Physical exercise has an enormous benefit. But some of the things that I don't think work are, for example, um, Mozart CDs to be played to your newborn or to be played in utero. This is the claim that parents can create enriched environments to aid their children's brain development, you know, like playing music in utero, as you mentioned, that it actually rewires the brain, can make your kids smarter? I think that really hasn't been supported by the science at all. I think if you look at the extreme, if you say, all right, well, let's say if you you take a newborn and sensory deprive it, then, yeah, you can impair you can impair activity-dependent brain development. And one of the interesting things is that In utero and then following in that first five years of life, the brain develops not just according to a genetic program, but it's guided by experience. And so experience is crucially important, but if you live in kind of a normal situation where you're having, you know, a a lot of experiences, you don't have a deficit. It's not like your brain is going to develop better if you're being bombarded with expensive mobiles and toys and Mozart CDs than it does if you're just kind of a regular kid in a regular place, 
you know, playing and interacting and, and, and doing what kids do. Or when the child's older playing one of the, you know, like brain age or, or something that purports to raise your IQ through mental exercises. Well, I mean, the thing is, IQ is a funny thing, right? People say, well, you can't study to improve on an IQ test. Well, that's wrong, right? So there are certain classes, there are certain classes of tasks you can improve on. Uh, in that way through practice. And uh, there are some indications that certain kinds of computer software can produce very small effects in things like improving reaction time uh, among the elderly and improving cognitive capacity. But those effects are very, very small, and they pale in comparison to the effects of, say, uh, doing aerobic exercise for 45 minutes a day. Mm. That effect on your cognitive capacity when you're 60 years old is much larger than the effect of buying the software that's offered by a number of these companies for this purpose mm. at a great expense. And I didn't invite you on the show to talk about uh, improving cognitive capacity and all that, but just one more question on that point. What do you think about the smart drugs? It's maybe it's fringe science. I would hesitate to call it pseudoscience, but it's on the borderlands of science. The arguments coming out of psychopharmacology uh, that you know certain drugs can um, increase your cognitive performance, um, and I'm not just talking about the amphetamine type drugs, you know, but drugs that give you better memory, you know, just like steroids for the brain. There's no question that the amphetamine type drugs can improve people's focus and they can improve your function in a lot of ways. They work. So it's not, you don't have to have, a, uh, have ADHD to benefit from Ritalin. Everybody does better on Ritalin. Right. Everybody does better on um, Adderall. Uh, it helps you to focus. It doesn't improve your memory. It doesn't improve your cognitive function per se, but it does help you to focus on the task at hand. And in that sense, it is a cognitive enhancer. But in terms of drugs that actually improve, for example, the storage of memory as opposed to uh, just one's ability to focus, there's been a lot of effort uh, on this, both in sort of the fringe and people offering, you know, herbal drinks and, you know, smart cocktails, which, you know, are mostly nonsense, and some biotech startup companies. There's a place called Memory Pharmaceuticals, for example. Mm -hmm. But basically... Very, very little has come out of that to date. Okay. Uh, I'm willing to believe that it is possible to develop drugs that actually directly improve memory function, but so far there's very little there. Hmm. Um, I was interested that in this book, uh, I mentioned its breadth, you touch a little on sexual orientation. Uh, you argue that being gay is due at least somewhat to what's going on physically in the brain. Well, I, I would say I would step back a bit and say, uh, you know, for a lot of complex human behaviors, whether it's something like general intelligence or sexual orientation or even childhood shyness, when you do analysis of families and you look at the heritability and you look at adopted twin studies, which are sort of the gold standard for this, uh, what you find is that for all of these things, there is a genetic component and there is a non-genetic component. And that in the non-genetic component, there are sociocultural aspects and then there are biological factors that are not genetic. An example of one of those would be, for example, if your mother has the flu while she's pregnant with you, your chance of becoming schizophrenic is about five times higher than it is otherwise. So that's not something genetic, but it is biological. So to get to sexual orientation, if you just look at the genetics to start with, and you say, well, if you look at the siblings of straight folks and gay folks and look at the probability of being straight or gay, as a consequence of this, it's totally clear that there is a degree of heritability to sexual orientation. Uh, and so if you look at twins, for example, monozygotic, so-called identical twins, have a much higher incidence of coordinate uh, sexual orientation than do fraternal twins, uh, even if they have been raised within the same family. Hmm. So the evidence for some degree of genetic basis 
for sexual orientation is very strong. Now, what that will turn out to be, and putting a number to it, uh, I would say is unclear. Maybe it's going to turn out to be 25%. Maybe it's going to turn out to be 80%. Uh, and we don't yet know. And we don't yet actually have particular genes that are associated with sexual orientation. Uh, now, to move on to the brain, we know that there are certain structural features of the brain, particularly regions of a very low brain structure called the hypothalamus. Right, LeVay's work years ago or something, that there's a difference in the hypothalamus between men and women and maybe between gay men and straight men. Right. And